Hi everyone, I am about to start the recording and the transcription, uh, making sure that the transcription does work. Yep, it does. Excellent. Okay, well, welcome to the kickoff meeting and congratulations to everybody in here um, for being a, uh, awarded a round 22 grant. Round 22 was a heck of an application round. Uh, there were many good applications. We had to turn down quite a few, and we really hope that those uh, who were turned down will revise and resubmit because there were just so many great ideas, and uh, y'all were at the top of the uh, of the list. So it's, it's excellent to see you all here, and today we're just going to uh, connect with each other a little bit. I'm going to take you through some of the key ALG stuff that we've got to offer first. We'll do some introductions. Uh, then we will talk about the nitty gritty, the grant procedure stuff that everybody needs to know um, in order for payments to go forward and for signatures to, to go through. Uh, yep. And uh, yep. Hi, Jean. Greetings from KSU, representing herself and the amazing Tammy Powell, of course. Uh, and Amelia, hi everyone, also from KSU with Gene. Excellent. We'll do some introductions uh, very soon too. So first, I'm going to take you through a quick look of what we have here at ALG. So I'm going to go share my window here. If the windows decide that they want to do something. Here we go. Perfect. OK. I'm going to blow this up a little bit make sure that everybody can see it. I'm going to zoom in. So this is not usually how the site looks, but I am zooming in so that everyone can see. This is the Affordable Learning Georgia website. If you apply for a grant, you probably have seen this before. Uh, but if you haven't, this is uh, kind of the hub for everything that we have to offer. It's at affordablelearninggeorgia.org, kind of a long URL, but it is at least the exact name of what we have. Um, we have three big buttons down here that direct folks to the most important places that they want to go. If you're looking for the OER that were created through this program, and by doing the asynchronous training, you should know what OER is all about, open educational resources, they're open licensed, you can repurpose them, you can revise them. The ones that Georgia folks have created, you can go into open educational resources, and you'll find the two places for them that I will show you a little bit later. Statistics, research, and reports. If people are looking for data, and this is especially administrators, uh, champions who want to do a report for their institution, uh, even media outlets when they want to report on what Georgia is doing, that this is going to be the place where you want to go. And then there's affordable materials grants. This has the entire history of our grant program all the way back to round one, and it has the hub for everything that you'll need to know um, about the grant procedures. And that is in here, current grantees, reports, and deadlines. This is a super helpful, super important link, and we'll talk about it a couple of times today. This is the ALG grants equivalent of the syllabus that you have to keep pointing everyone towards because that's where everything is. Um, here we've got every deadline by semester. We even have the old ones of summer 2022. Um, fall reporting deadline is December 19th. As we will explain, you do not have to worry about this one at all because it is coming up way too soon. Then spring, then summer, then fall. They'll always be here whenever you want to check on it. Um, there's all the ways that you can submit a report, including our templates and our forms to submit them. Um, the reporting guidelines, uh, some platforms and ways to host stuff, uh, some research resources in case you're interested in uh, doing some research as a part of this. And then the online kickoff training. So we will have the most recent kickoff, this one. Um, right on YouTube. So if you're watching that right now, hello, how are you? Um, the presentation slides are going to be here as well. And there's a little thing about the ALG grantees listserv. I just recently added all of you to that listserv. If you were a grantee in a previous round, then you were already there. But if you are a new grantee, now you have um, uh, more of a 
uh, way for us to connect with you about reporting deadlines and such. OK, so this is a really important page and we will be directing you towards it a couple of times. I heavily recommend that if you are a project lead, bookmark this page. It is a place to go. Now we have two big homes for OER, the stuff that has been created as a part of these grants. This is Galileo Open Learning Materials. It was our first ever repository. Uh, we had our grants a couple of years before we got this repository, this place to store open materials that were created during the grants. We thought that there was so much great open material out there that we wouldn't have to have a place to host our own OER. It's all out there. Just go ahead and use it. Well, that was not the case at all. People created so much good stuff that we needed a place to host it. So this is what we started with. Um, this is a repository in the old sense of the word. It's got entries in here that look a lot like any library resource you would go to. Um, you've got the author fields and you've got the description fields. We've got a few custom fields in here for course title and course number. Uh, the Creative Commons license is built right in. Here's where it was published, uh, all of that stuff. And you can download the full text of this particular one. Uh, these guys had a word version and some lecture slides and some primary source exercises there. That's pretty cool. Uh, you can search in just this collection in the whole repository or across every repository, which is uh, a little bit uh, more. You will see here in the kind of analytics section down here that we have had over 2 million total downloads since 2016. And just about anywhere where English is a primary or second language, you will see some usage. So you just saw one in Uttar Pradesh alongside uh, Iowa. So really interesting uh, usage going on. You can also see the top 10 downloads of all time. Educational learning theories is a really big one with 389,000 downloads. So very cool. But all of these, of course, are static files. We wanted a way to make these open resources both still accessible for faculty to create and more interactive and accessible for students to use. So we partnered with Manifold in 2020. Uh, Manifold is a new project. It came out of the University of Minnesota and uh, some partnerships with the City, Uni uh, City University of New York or CUNY system. And this place is a, a place where you could take static files like Word documents and EPUBs and convert them over into texts that are a lot more interesting. So for example, here is uh, Latinx Media. And I'll, I'll go back to the project home to show you what this looks like. Um, we've got the grant documentation over here because this was created in round 19. We've got the source document right here. And we've got the start reading button. If I hit that, I go right to the introduction. And because this was originally a Word document that had header ones and header twos, we have chapters and subchapters that arise from that structure. So not only does structured text with headers, uh, which you just do by using the styles uh, in, in Word, not only does that make it more accessible to screen readers, but it also makes it way more cool when you can bring it over into Manifold. So I'll go over to the second chapter of this unit, and here we are, you've got live links. I can go up here and if there were a lot of highlights, I could turn those off or annotations. The public can do this. You can do these on your own and have them private if you wanna create an account. Um, you can even create a group like your entire class and have everybody uh, annotate and highlight together. You can change things from serif to sans serif. You can enlarge the fonts. You can bring it back down. You can turn on dark mode or light mode. You can uh, close the margins up a little bit or expand them. You can bring everything back to default. But let's say that I wanted any mention of television because I'm seeing television right here on the screen and I want to search uh, within the text. Well, then I can find exactly where television is mentioned throughout all of this Latinx media text. What I also can do is go all the way back to the home page and search for television 
And if I do that here, I'm going to find every mention of television, even in the annotations, just in case somebody wanted to mention it. So here's some in not just Latinx media, but also uh, annotations in, in the film appreciation text, uh, some that are in a Spanish uh, instructional text <laughs> uh, over in a theater chapter. Um, yeah, so you, you can look across all of these open textbooks at once too. So we will work with you on getting any materials that you've created into a, an instance of Manifold. If they're just ancillary materials that you can download, we'll put them up for download. If you're creating an entirely new open textbook, um, then we'll help you in getting this into Manifold in a really cool way. Uh, we even have some training resources in here, including a champions welcome training and kickoff training and all of this. Uh, all of these are entries here and uh, you know, a few folks from Kennesaw, including a few that are here today, created a student success workshop that we host right here on OpenALG as well. So it's it's exciting. It's a new home for these resources. It doesn't link up to our library discovery system the way that Galileo Open Learning Materials does, and therefore we have both, and we create entries in this one for this one. Um, hopefully that'll be fixed in the future, but for now, um, we just link out to Manifold from Galileo Open Learning Materials to make our stuff maximally discoverable. Now, along with all of this, we are going to be under a huge change very soon. Uh, we have been working with the uh, web person for Galileo, uh, Jason Steele, and we have been working with our um, basically our, our marketing coordinator, Joy Woodson, uh, in creating a new way to tell the Affordable Learning Georgia story and get people to where they need to go uh, in, in a new website. So we've been working on this for quite a while. We've been gathering a ton of feedback for years, and we're finally putting all of that into practice. Uh, so this will be the new ALG website. This is just the homepage in its draft form. So you're seeing something that isn't yet out there. Um, we have what's called a mega menu. So now if you have a navigation element, you can have sub navigation in here. So about, about us and about OER. Now the about section makes a way more sense than it used to. Uh, here's our grants, the overview of grants, apply for our grants, and here's the information center page uh, that we keep saying, please bookmark that page, right? Uh, resources, so if you want to create resources, here's the accessibility guides to do so. Here's stuff about customizing, here's open licensing, uh, finding it, learning it, and then we have a new way to announce news, and I cannot wait for this. Uh, news and events will be over here in an ALG events page. We'll be able to get the word out a lot more efficiently than we used to. All of this is still not out there and published yet. This is just uh, a quick look at what you're going to see probably by the end of January into February, including a new data page too, uh, which is still, all of this is still being worked on for sure, but we are in uh, the, the home stretch of releasing a new web page. So that is why I wanted to show you all of that. So we've got the ALG website. Uh, it directs you to a whole bunch of cool stuff, but if you want to get to the most important things, here's OER, our reports, and everything about our grants in the big buttons. We've got Galileo Open Learning Materials, our first repository, connects to all of our library resources too. Uh, so we are able to uh, share all of the old OER that we have and the new stuff gets put into Manifold, which makes it way more interactive. And yeah, uh, that's just a quick look at everything that we have. I'm going to stop sharing this. Here we go. And I'm going to go back into sharing the PowerPoint. I wish I could just switch between them, but that is not the case. There we are. And I'm going to look at the chat for a second there. Oh, <laughs> someone said, I hear a cat. Yeah, so I um, I did a mute all just to make sure that um, folks were OK there. Uh, yeah, so does anybody have any questions about this before I take you into the ALG tracking spreadsheet 
to let you know how that looks and and how our data works. OK, uh, the link to the uh, web page for Manifold to open ALG is alg.manifoldapp.org. And I just put that into the chat. All right, the next thing I'm going to do is uh, share a look at the Excel sheet that we work within quite a bit for all of our data so that you know what happens once, uh, especially once the project is all done with, because uh, things are quite interesting from that point onward. OK, so this is a very, very big sheet of grants data. Every single grant that we have, uh, it has a row and it's over on the left. There's the, the grant number here. Um, we've got the purchase order number, which is helpful for the business office. Uh, we got the rounds number, just in case we need to filter by, you know, what happens in a particular round. The fiscal year, just in case that's different. Uh, the type, so we either have continuous improvement or transformation. The institution, how much was the total award? This is important for the last entire column in this sheet. The final semester for the project, which means that this is the first time that implementation is guaranteed. Uh, there is the project leads name and email address. We will contact this person yearly um, for the sustainability survey, uh, a way to check in and see if the work that you did on these projects is still ongoing, if those savings are still ongoing, if uh, students are still affected that way. We've got the course names, the course numbers, and the USG uh, subject area that this is a part of. This goes by the academic discipline committees uh, that are here. So that's why it's called computing disciplines, because that's the official name of that particular academic discipline committee. Um, the final report results, there are three big questions that we have, uh, student opinion, student performance, and uh, student course level retention. Um, whether or not the changes in them were positive, neutral, or negative. Uh, then we have the annual savings estimate, annual student savings per student, and then all of this data that you put in for uh, your proposal, it's the students per summer, fall, and spring. And if the first implementation semester is different, it will be marked here. Uh, if something has been scaled up with a new project, we can't double count uh, the old course, so we have to put in, uh, that no, this project was not scaled up. And now you can see here that these uh, did not get started in spring 2015. It was a while, so these were zeroed out, zeroed out, zeroed out for a little bit. And we're just going to keep going here. Oh, here's the first sustainability check. Uh, it doesn't really matter that these are continued or not, because right now it hasn't started yet. It hasn't started yet. Fall 2020 is when it starts, and so we get to fall 2020, and bam. All right, so these projects that started over here in fall 2020 suddenly have a formula in the column for fall 2020 students, and it says that if the sustainability check is continued, then put in the number of students that um, are affected per fall semester. If it does not say continued, put zero. So if we can't find you and we don't know the status of your sustainability check, we put unknown and unknown is zero. Um, if we uh, if you say that, yes, it's been discontinued, we put discontinued and at that point it is zero. And then everything else is just a multiplier from there. We multiply it by the per student savings as uh, as marked in the proposal and then as updated as needed in the sustainability check. And going onward, things start to happen. Uh, we did not know the status of number 478, and therefore this got zeroed out. Um, over here, this one was discontinued, and so it is no longer running. The other ones are continued, so they still go and go and go and go. We have hit fall 2022. Uh, some of the old projects or the mini grants uh, were 
they do not have uh, savings attached to them because they are not uh, geared towards uh, increased student savings. They're in they're geared towards sustainability and continuous improvement. So those uh, sometimes the formula is like, hey, we don't have a value here. Well, yeah, of course you don't. Uh, these weren't ones that we were targeting. Here though, here's the grand total of students affected during the project. Here's the grand total of savings that have happened uh, ever since the project got implemented. And then using the award amount from the beginning, we do the savings per $1 awarded and, uh, over the total award. So you can see here that the, the return on investment when it comes to student savings can be pretty high. It's pretty awesome. So that's where you're going to uh, see a lot of this data that happens later on. Um, you're in the very beginning stages of all that. Uh, so some of this you're probably looking at like, what the heck? But this is why we will keep in contact with you after the grant process is all done. Uh, it's why our sustainability surveys are so important and it's really important in keeping our data accurate and making sure that things are still ongoing. Um, so that is the other part of the uh, grand tour of ALG. It's kind of a, a look behind the scenes uh, over in, in the backstage room to see what's going on over there. So now I'm gonna open up this presentation again. And now, okay, we've only, yeah, it's 122, excellent, great. All right, so now we are going to do introductions. Let me start up my camera here. Hi, everyone. Oh, yep. Yeah. I am in my office in Athens. It's good to see you all. You'll see some uh, OpenStax text right here. Uh, OpenStax has print resources and they uh, sent some of those out a long time ago to show that, yes, these are indeed giant textbooks that uh, can be printed out if you would like. Uh, yeah, it's it's been great to uh, be running this program. I've started all the way back in 2014. Um, with a few folks here in Galileo. We've had some amazing people, Marie Lassiter and Tiffany Tiarina working uh, on ALG as well with instructional design. Um, the head of Galileo, the executive director, Lucy Harrison, also works on ALG quite a bit. Um, when somebody needs to talk to the upper administration in the university system, that's usually Lucy going out to Atlanta and talking about the cool stuff that we've done. Uh, so uh, it is just me at the moment. We are hiring a program manager uh, and that search is going to begin in uh, January as all of the applications are coming in at the moment. Uh, but I still have a lot of folks who do help me out with this, including um, our admin here who helps us with our service level agreements and our invoices, uh, Dina Anderson. Um, we have uh, someone who works on our subscriptions. So for eBooks and for uh, our contracts in running our repository, there's John Stevens. Um, a lot of the Galileo folks really do put their heart and soul into everything they do, including helping out with ALG. So even though I'm kind of the face of it today, know that there are more people here uh, who do work on this whole project. So. Let's go around the room and we are going to go by project team. Um, what I'm going to do is uh, just call on you by your team. And so I'm going to quickly go into here and get all of those going. Yeah, okay, sorry. Another Excel sheet that I have to go through here. Hey, no. Technical issues, just a second. Yes, cool. OK, uh, so I've got the slide up on the screen of, of what we would like to share. And we'll just go by by uh, team and by project lead, because if everybody introduces themselves, we could take a very, very long time. Um, but we'll do team by team. So what we'll start with is uh, a project from the University of West Georgia uh, with Yvonne Fuentes as the project lead, um, the professor of Spanish. 
Hello, thank you. Hello. I'm here with, we're a team of three, three uh, professors of, of Spanish, uh, Elizabeth Solis and Karen Dollinger, and I know they're here at the meeting. And then our, our digital expert is Brian Roberts. Um, um, and so he's helping us with all that other, uh, that other part of the project. Our project is a textbook transformation uh, for fourth semester Spanish. Uh, we had gotten a grant, our, our university had gotten a grant uh, about maybe three, four years ago, and they did 1001 to 2000, the first three semesters of Spanish. But four semesters Spanish was always uh, a, a different book and, and, and something different. And so we figured, let's go ahead and redo something uh, as well for that. Our textbook is going to be a little bit different from our regular second semester intermediate Spanish in that each chapter is profession career centered so that it will be the usual grammar and vocabulary review that you would expect at an intermediate level. But the chapters, the topics then or themes are going to be Spanish in the medical field. So all the vocabulary, all the grammar exercises, all the readings will be geared towards Spanish in the medical field, uh, Spanish in banking, Spanish in mass communications, et cetera. So it's a bit of a three prong approach because the third aspect of it is each chapter then is also connected to a geographical area of the Spanish speaking world. And so we're really excited and we're very, very happy that we, we were awarded the grant. Um, we've started already with the textbook. Um, the textbook itself is almost complete. We're now into the, the, the writing, the written part of exercises and wow. filing the, the, we started working in this in May and we figured we're going to do this with or without the grant. We've got the grant, so that's even better. Um, and so at this point, we're ready to pass it on to Brian, who's going to start then uh, formatting and will work. And we figured we could do maybe a chapter a month for the spring semester. And then we get to proofread and fix everything and make sure all the images and everything is accessible, et cetera. So that's what our project did is uh, our timeline is to roll it out in, in the fall, of course. Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, also from UWG, uh, William Kenyon and his team. Go ahead. Yeah. <laughs> Hi. Um, so I'm I'm Sarah, and Bill is here with me. Um, we're actually doing a project where we're going to transform to an OpenStax textbook for um, the microbiology course for the biology majors. This is an important course because it's required for every major to take. Um, in order to graduate. So we're going to switch to, um, of course, the zero cost OpenStax textbook. Um, we are going to generate some uh, demonstration videos for laboratory techniques, develop some group work activities, and then of course, redevelop the actual laboratory component for the students to get reinforcement of laboratory skills. That's pretty much it. <laughs> Very cool. Thank you so much. Um, and if you have any uh, remarks or comments or questions or anything like that, if you want to type them right into the chat as we go around, that'll uh, help us in keeping those questions in mind and uh, responding as we go. Um, so from Clayton State, Dimitri Viznosko. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, I think I'm the only one here. We have a small team, just myself and uh, Tatiana Kovacev, that's entire physics department and Clayton. Uh, we had a couple of uh, LG grants before, uh, specifically the astronomy transformation and the uh, continuous improvement for all the physics labs, um, where we redid kind of the research, the whole idea, what is physics labs and how they should go uh, together with the text. Uh, this grant, uh, is the transformation It's much smaller scale only for the introductory physics for bio students, uh, specifically the algebra based. And uh, the main changes besides switching to the OER textbook from the current $250 one, when I saw that I was going crazy. <laughs> that was an expensive textbook. Um, we're also gonna develop a lot of new uh, exams, quizzes, uh, and specifically group projects uh, and capstone projects for this class uh, that will be biology related uh, so that students will get ready for our class that next possibility we're thinking of biophysics. But that's in plans, right? We'll see how things go from there. Hey, right, thank you for attention. Thank you so much. Okay, uh, from University of North Georgia, we've got Lori Wilson's team. Uh, 
Hi, I, I don't know if you can hear me. Can you hear me all yeah, right? Yeah, I can hear you. I, okay, I'm on my phone. <laughs> um, I'm, <laughs> I'm actually Miles Sedgwick. Um, I'm Anna Rumbaugh is here uh, as well. Uh, we had a slight crisis on one of our other campuses, so Lori is actually up in Blue Ridge <laughs> right oh, now dealing okay. with that. Um, so our grant is basically we're transforming our chemistry, um, our survey of chemistry course. So it's our chemistry course for our um, allied health majors, mainly our uh, nursing students, uh, things like that. And we're basically doing specific, we're changing the kind of grading system in general. We're doing specifications based grading. And so we're trying to gear the class, the resources in lecture and in lab to kind of coincide with this um, specifications grading along with uh, removing the expensive text so the the class text I think was a hundred and some hundred and fifty something dollars the lab had another hundred dollar fee so we're trying to reduce that cost as much as possible to the student so that's <clears throat> that's where we are with that I mean hopefully you know we're we're getting this stuff to, you know we're working over the summer and hopefully in fall we'll be able to roll out at least the updated lab portion of it and then most of the uh, lecture material will come in the fall and uh, spring very cool. Thank you so much. Um, so from Georgia Gwinnett College, uh, Jenna Andrews uh, Swan's team. Hi, everyone. Um, I am here representing a wonderful team of anthropologists from GGC. Um, we are uh, myself, uh, Mary Beth Krastowski, Kate Dealey, both of whom I think are on the call, and uh, Greg Gallette, who's a uh, way out of the country visiting family. Um, our plan with this uh, round of the ALG grant that we we're excited to get is to um, transform an introduction to anthropology textbook. So this is a four field textbook. We cover all things anthropology. Um, and our goal is, in addition to cost savings for students, to um, integrate a lot of engaging contemporary examples of traditional anthropology concepts. Um, and so one of the things that we're going to attempt is to actually hire a couple of students to help us write uh, sort of vignettes and case studies and kind of, you know, give us some feedback on how engaging, you know, these chapters that we're going to write actually are. Uh, and so, you know, our timeline is pretty similar to what others have mentioned. Um, and, you know, we'll, we'll let you all know how that, you know, engaging students goes. Uh, so yeah, that's it. Thanks, y'all. Thank you very much. Uh, from Georgia Gwinnett College too, uh, Amy Battles and her team. Hello. Hello. Uh, we are a group of five. We have three physicists and one librarian. We are transforming an algebra-based physics one course, the mechanics into uh we're going to use the uh an open stacks book we are developing uh instructional videos that are short and with the annotation and we're going to have videos over the concepts that you know match up with the book the um problem solving how to do that think things through and then we're also adding uh, laboratory materials. All of us are rewriting some labs and also adding instructional videos for the labs themselves. So we're uh, going to be pretty busy. Our timeline is pretty much like everybody else's. We're hoping to have it live by fall. Um, and as far as just questions about the project itself, I guess Things will be answered along the way today. It's just like things like uh, what hosting would be more appropriate for the types of materials and stuff like that. That's really the only questions we have, those kinds of details, but that's it. Thank you, and uh, please send an email to me about um, about hosting, especially any uh, questions that you have about particular resources. Um, that'll be something we can probably cover on a case by case basis for sure. All right, um, from College of Coastal Georgia, uh, C. Tate Holbrook and uh, their team. Hey, I'm Tate Holbrook and uh, Jennifer Hatchell's here with me and we're part of a, a big team of eight, uh, seven faculty who are, who are all biologists and then a uh, staff support uh, lab coordinator. 
And the focus of this project is to create new um, custom lab manuals for our introductory biology sequence, um, principles of biology one and two for primarily for, for biology majors. Uh, and we're currently using a commercial uh, lab manual that's quite expensive and not very effective. And so we're going to be um, creating um, new, putting together new labs, developing labs, and also kind of you know revising and repurposing labs that uh, better align with with our learning objectives, but also um, replacing some of the more conventional cookbook lab exercises that are in the commercial manual with more um, inquiry based activities to actually get students engaged in the the process of doing science. Very cool. Thank you so much. Uh, so from uh, Kennesaw State University, this is uh, Jenny Jean and her team. Hi everyone and uh, Jeff, Hello. nice meeting you. I saw you many years ago at Macon in yeah. 2015 for <laughs> the first time we received the ALG grant for Asia 1102 Introduction to Asian Cultures. And then several years later, I think it was 2021, we received another round of ALG grant to enhance the teaching materials for Asia 1102 Introduction to Asian Cultures. Thanks to your support. Now every year we offer 12 sections of this course, 480 students and potentially many, many more students from Kennesaw State to take this course for, the, uh, for their GN Ed, as well as for BA in Asian Studies. So, so far we have more than 100 Asian Studies majors and uh, uh, 53 Asian Studies minors. And they all are required to take Asia 3001, Understanding Asia. This is the only one required upper division course for the interdisciplinary degree of BA in Asian Studies, the only degree in Asian Studies in the University System of Georgia. We're very proud of your support for this course. And we are a team of five Asian Studies faculty members, uh, Dr. Jin Yi Jian, myself, Dr. Sha Huang, Dr. Hai Wang Kim, and Dr. Xue Fei Ma. And um, I think we're all very hardworking, like everyone else on the, uh, for the ALG grant recipients. And we want to develop comprehensive textbook, uh, free textbook package that include um, um, the materials that would uh, easily pass digital accessibility uh, with Word, uh, Word document, PPTX, and uh, quizzes, and uh, multimedia links. And so this will be in the same process of the being Asian Studies growing rapidly under the leadership of Asian Studies coordinator, Dr. Sha Huang, who is also here um, today. And uh, if you all want to add something, please do, Dr. Huang and Dr. Hai Wang Kim and Dr. Xue Fei Ma. And if they don't add, add anything, that means uh, I have spoken for everyone. Thank you for your support. No problem. Uh, congratulations on the comprehensiveness of that. <laughs> Oh, OK, uh, we've got thank you, May uh, from Sha Hong. All right, um, from Georgia Southern University, we've got Jin Ki Kim and their team. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Uh, a little bit. It's coming in a little soft. Hello? Yep. Way better. Okay. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is uh, Jin Ki Kim, and I'll, I'm working with uh, Dr. Uh, Jun Choi on this project together. And we're very, very proud and grateful for this award. And our, our project is going to be about uh, transforming uh, textbooks and lab um, uh, materials for two courses. Uh, one is on uh, autonomous vehicle sensors, and the other one is on uh, the uh, PLC programmable uh, logic uh, controllers. And those, those courses, uh, uh, the materials are uh, 
we we have materials out in you know commercial ones. However, the the field itself is changing uh, pretty fast. So we would like to uh, create a, a, a material that is more uh, up to date and also suitable for our students. And yeah, that's going to be our about our project. And thank you for the support. And I, we really look forward to creating the materials for our students. Thank you so much. Uh, um, from Georgia Tech, we have Melissa Ionetta and her team. Oh, you're on mute. And I can tell you that my colleague Suchi Dutta, who was here, is laughing right now because I am <laughs> sort of famous at Georgia Tech for always starting on mute. I'm, I think I might try to convince people that it's my signature move, right? <laughs> um, I'm the executive director of writing and communication at Georgia Tech. Andy Frazee, who's the director of the writing and communication program, is actually the program lead here, but I told him I'd sit in for him today because he had three meetings that he absolutely had to be in and he was down to two after I took this one. I don't really know which one he chose. Um, we are, our write, writing program um, weds the USG requirements for English 1101 and 1102 to our uh, sort of site specific commitment to written, oral, visual and electronic communication and nonverbal, excuse me, woven as we call it locally. Um, we're using this, the uh, grant under the auspices of these, this grant, we're moving from a custom published text, which honestly the cost just seemed to have gotten out of control over the years. Uh, it was started as a cost saving measure for students and you know, uh, first one's free and then once they've got your hook, they start bringing up the price, right? Mm. So where um, our postdoctoral fellows, many of your schools have hired our postdoctoral fellows and thanks to all of you for that. Our postdoctoral fellows are working in a team um, under the le leadership of me and Andy and Suchi Dutta, the program uh, manager, who's a project manager who's online with us today. And we will be taking our proprietary materials, um, revising and expanding them and making them open access because doesn't it make sense that if we're teaching electronic online communication, we're using electronic online sources. Um, so and our timeline is everyone's timeline. Um, we have the Britain fellows who are committed to the grant. We'll be running an internal, uh, you know, sort of solicitation of um, of applications from other Britain fellows who want to work on this this summer. And we will optimistically but accurately assume we will be all in place by September 1st. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much, too. OK, uh, from Augusta University, uh, Karen Wiles oh, and there's one more from Georgia oh. Tech, Jeff. Oh, go ahead. OK, uh, yeah, my name is David Hu. I'm working with uh, David and Kai, who's a grad student at Georgia Tech and at Kennesaw uh, State. Um, if uh, so, if you've ever heard of the Ig Nobel Prize um, for research that makes you laugh and think, I've won in two Ig Nobel Prizes. First, for showing <laughs> how long it takes mammals to pee. <laughs> and the second for showing why wombats make cubic feces. Um, <laughs> so the work we're doing here is trying to improve um, understanding and retention and engineering courses, um, basically, especially fluid mechanics. Um, we see a lot of the students that drop the course or fail are because of not having enough prerequisites. And so our goal of this is to basically make a math primer, a um, series of videos, and um, uh, online resources that can get them up to speed um, during the class. Um, we've d we've basically given to them for one or two semesters the feedback we've gotten that it's still too difficult. Some of the material that we're providing is still too hard for uh, some of these students, and it makes sense. Some of them have failed calculus a few times, and um, they're basically just getting through. Um, um, and uh, so this semester, we're going to keep on making the videos on the topics and try to um, make the material some broad level so we can have those basically students who are on different levels. And um, I'm going to contact you, Amy Battles, because it sounds like you're working on something for physics, so maybe we can share some materials. So I'm glad we're doing this session. Thank you. Very cool. Uh, so 
Yep, I am going uh, down the list of, I, I was doing transformation and then continuous improvement. So if your institution, uh, ha if your project hasn't been called yet, but I called someone from your institution, you have not been missed. It's okay. <laughs> oh, okay, sorry. I thought you were doing all the Georgia Tech people. Oh, no, that's that's totally fine. Um, so now uh, we are going to Georgia State uh, with Antara Dutta and her team. Hello. Hello. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Anta Dutta, and uh, my team has four faculty members and two staff members. Uh, I hope some of them are here today. So our project is uh, about general chemistry textbook transformation. We are trying to create digital textbook um, for Chem 1212, which is a perimeter called uh, Principles of Chemistry 2. Uh, course and um, we have done this before and I'm excited to complete our sequence. Uh, so basically we are trying to be different from the OpenStax textbook. We will uh, include a lot of simulations and interactive uh, elements to our textbook. Uh, and um, our timeline is just like everybody else. We are also planning to implement in classroom in fall 22. And um, I'm really looking forward to work with everyone and finish this textbook. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now from uh, Augusta University, Karen Wiles and her team. Hello, everybody. Um, I'm here with one of my teammates, Dr. Ramon <laughs> Diaz. <laughs> um, we are a group of five anatomy and physiology faculty, and we are proposing to no longer use a um, commercially available lab manual. We find that the lecture text is sufficient to help our students with the gross anatomy um, of the different organ systems, but what we find, um, and the students really do well um, in mastering that content, but we find that they really struggle with the microscopic anatomy, um, the different tissue histologies. So we're proposing to create um, a, an atlas for histology and kind of extend that into a workbook. Um, and we have really talented artists on our team, and we're going to have um, uh, images of the tissue histology under the microscope side by side with hand drawn images, um, little cartoon pictures, and we're going to overlay specific structures onto the uh, microscope image to help students identify specific uh, landmarks on that tissue to help them uh, kind of understand what they're looking at. And hopefully that will help with retention um, in this kind of gateway class that we have. Um, and we're hoping to extend this into our anatomy two class as well in a future proposal. Excellent. OK, um, from Kennesaw. Oh, wait, hold on a second. Hold on. <laughs> One second here. No, sorry, from Albany State, um, Li Kyu Zhang and your team. Oh, uh, Dr. La Messi will represent our team. Uh, yes, good afternoon. Hello. Can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yeah. I am Donna Mesa Messi, and I'm part of the team at Albany State. Um, I'm working with Dr. Zhang and Dr. Chang and Dr. Medlin. And we are in the process of uh, trying to compile resources and create a textbook for physical science one. Now, the timing of this grant couldn't be better because we also are working on a grant to revamp the labs at Albany State. And so it's a perfect time for us to streamline the textbook with the new labs that we and all the new equipment that we are so excited about. Uh, enrollment in the, at, for this course is around 780 students per year um, because it's required for the sonography students and it's required for middle grade education. And it's also used to satisfy uh, the science requirement for the non-science majors. Uh, we currently use a commercial textbook that's kind of expensive like science textbooks tend to be. And so the purchase rate is low because it's even more difficult to convince, especially the non-science majors who make up the bulk buy a book that they don't really in an area where they're not really interested so um so we are actually really excited to get this done um because it's been uh apart from the fact that it's difficult to get the students to purchase the book um trying to use online physics resources makes it a bit difficult because the math is really at the trigonometry or calculus level where physical science you really just need algebra and so the, the calculations are off so hopefully this is going to streamline 
the material and make it easier for them uh, um, to stay in the course and stay interested um, because at least it's going to be take off a good $97 off of their um, semester budget. Excellent. Uh, well, thank you. Um, now from Kennesaw, uh, Amelia Lewis and your team. Hi, everyone. Um, yeah, so we are very glad to be here and we are um, focusing on a creating affordable learning modules to replace textbooks, but also with a focus on diversity and inclusion, um, especially since Kennesaw has an extremely diverse student population. So this grant addresses um, English composition 1101 and 1102 at our university and of various modalities with those two classes as well. So we will be using some OER resources that already exist, but we'll also be creating our own materials to really tailor it toward um, not only our program, but also our students. Um, and everybody on the team has a background in DEI and DEI pedagogy as well. Um, as part of this project, we will be hiring student assistants for usability testing, which will be not only just usability in the sense of do these modules work well, but also um, hopefully creating engaging materials. So I, I think someone else talked about like <laughs> making sure students are actually engaged with um, the, the resources that we're putting together. And then we also have somebody in our university diversity and inclusion office that's going to review our materials as well for rollout in the fall. Um, I don't I don't think we have any questions right now, except for things that will probably answered along the way. So, you know, when it comes to the point of uploading things, just little questions like that. But um, yeah, we are very excited about our grant. And if anybody else is um, doing anything that's diversity and inclusion related, I'd love to talk with you. Excellent. Um, from Columbus State, we have Ben Kamau and his team. Hello, everyone. Hello. Yeah, I'm Ben Kamau from Columbus State University. I'm glad to be here with uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Nihal Shukla. And uh, at CSU, we have we've received uh, LG grants in the past, one of which was uh, scaling quantitative analysis, uh, math course, and also elementary statistics. And those have been ongoing. Uh, actually, my colleague uh, Nihal Shukar has been part of the Math 1001 uh, ALG grant scaling initiative. And this uh, project is part of an ongoing effort. Uh, Shukla and I have had uh, teaching calculus one mainly. And so this will add to part of the work that we've been undertaking, particularly to restructure uh, our calculus uh, from the four hours of lecture into three hours of lecture and then embed uh, what we are calling a calculus lab. So this project will be adapting uh, calculus OER to help us in these uh, uh, long term plan that we have for calculus sequences. And the three goals that we have is mainly number one is to reduce cost for students. Uh, number two is to improve the teaching and learning in calculus uh, by making uh, those structural and instructional changes uh, within our delivery and also uh, any other modifications that we think will be achieving our goal in uh, student success. Uh, we'll also be looking at uh, multiple representation of calculus concepts. And so we'll be looking not only at uh, calculus or ER, but we'll also be looking at creating our own uh, material, particularly uh, problem sets, uh, projects, as well as uh, in the calculus labs, we'll be using uh, GeoGebra, Desmos, as well as uh, instructional videos that uh, we think will be uh, critical in achieving our goal. 
uh, we'll also be reviewing the existing material that we've been uh, using individually and try to bring, bring all that together to make part of uh, the foundation that we need to build so that we can move from calculus one, calculus two, and eventually calculus three uh, in this review. So the main goal will be reduce the cost. The second goal will be making structural and instructional changes in our calculus sequence. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much. Uh, and from Kennesaw State, uh, we have Sandeep Das and uh, Ms. Tink. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, I am an associate professor at the Electrical and Computer Engineering at Kennesaw State University. Uh, for our Affordable Materials grant, we have total five faculty and a librarian in our team. We are also going to recruit a graduate student assistant to help with uh, the materials that we intend to uh, develop. So in this project, we are going to write a new textbook um, We'll use some uh, open source materials and as well as we'll contribute our own new materials and it will be a comprehensive and interactive textbook. Uh, it, it is mainly intended to uh, um, alleviate the need to purchase the current commercial textbook, but it will also include uh, some of the materials that are not available in um, traditional textbooks, such as components of simulations and they would be all integrated within the textbook. We are also keeping in mind about other instructors adopting this book in the future. So we'll create uh, some uh, materials such as uh, instructors solutions, um, which will also be developed at the same time along with this book. So we are all very excited about this project to get started. Our timeline is as same as the others uh, one year. And uh, uh, yeah, that's pretty much it from me. Thank you so much. OK, in the interest of timing, I have a big favor to ask for our continuous improvement grantees. Um, could the leads who are here today please share a little bit about your project in the chat? Uh, that way we still get to hear from you and also we are not leaving at four o'clock um, by doing so. Um, I think you'll you'll notice that um, we had two of us uh, before this particular um, meeting, and we used to run breakout groups and bounce between them because having two people to uh, administrate this uh, allows for things like breakout groups to happen, and that's really cool, but there's one of me right now, so uh, we have to kind of centralize all the introductions. Uh, so if you could type a little bit about your continuous improvement grant project into the chat, um, that would be amazing. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks, Dr. Gal. And uh, someone did mention that they they saw us in Macon. This this used to be a an in person meeting that we did in Macon, and we brought it online a little bit before. Uh, COVID hit, and ever since COVID hit, we've had it online. I think it's it's worked pretty well in in doing this online and having asynchronous training running alongside it. And shout outs to Kennesaw State University's own uh, Tiffany Tiarina for uh, developing the whole asynchronous training program. Oh, Sarah North, yep, doing uh, continuous improvement here for CS thirty four ten. Hello. Yingji and the Department of IT is doing Z degrees. It's amazing. Thank you so much for being here. And they've got blockchain tech, uh, blockchain tech and machine learning tech and fintech. So many cool things. Ethical hacking. Uh, tech innovation and entrepreneurship, uh, web and mobile application security, infrastructure defense. Uh, when it comes to IT uh, open educational resources, we tend to be one of the go-tos because of amazing programs like Kennesaw State. 
Uh, Anita, says Laura, and uh, uh, Laura Getty and I are English professors at UNG working on the five-year-old World Literature 2 anthology to replace broken links and revise by adding new text as necessary. Working with the UNG Press on this one to create a PDF version of the text, the original is an ebook. Uh, responding to user requests by creating the new version. Yeah, World Literature 2 is a really tough one to do. I mean, imagine creating an open educational resource that is about modern literature, meaning that just about everything is under some sort of all rights reserved copyright unless it's shared openly somewhere. And then you have to kind of consider the ethics of it. Is this the original creator? Do they have the rights to it? Did they give the rights to it? It is a, a heck of a project. Uh, Dennis Miller talking about uh, converting a previously written OER for Spanish 1 and 2 into an interactive ebook with interactions embedded in the text using H5P. Uh, H5P is an HTML based um, interactive educational activity generator of sorts. It's, it's a really cool resource. And thank you, uh, Bronson Long. Um, working with uh, Jamie Fagan, Karen Huggin, um, uh, veterans of the grant program themselves too. Uh, updating multiple choice questions, essays, discussions. Excellent. Uh, Shirley Abrahams working with Madhushri Benerjee and Lisa Palacio from uh, GTC for intro to the databases. Uh, Jean Labahannon and Tammy Powell, hello. Continuous improvement for low cost English 1101, finding OER with adaptive learning software in first year writing. Very cool. Focused on metacognition and personal learning and goal setting. Yeah. And that's what continuous improvement grants are all about is updating these materials, creating new ones to support it. Yeah, using visualization and game development language and environment processing. Both courses. So cool. The IT department from uh, GGC is also very active uh, with open educational resources. Excellent. Now, uh, keep putting these in chat. That's totally fine, and we can uh, read these as we go. What we're going to do is take a 15 minute break. Um, I will start at 2.17. I'll keep to my word here that this is a 15 minute break. Um, after that, we will come back and talk about grant procedures, especially service level agreements, invoices, and reports. Thank you so much. One quick thing, if you are listening to and viewing the recording, please jump 15 minutes ahead. Um, trying to cut out this 15 minute break in Adobe uh, turns my computer into a jet engine and then it really doesn't work out very well. Uh, this is an old PC at the moment. Uh, so if you can jump 15 minutes ahead, that helps me so much. Thanks.
Okay, it is 2.17. Uh, so we're going to get started on talking about the grant procedures. Um, this is an especially important part of the process. If you are a project lead, um, it will answer some questions that you will probably have in the next couple of weeks uh, as paperwork starts to go forward. Oh. OK, so what I'm going to do is hit you all real quick for ambient noise. OK, cool. Um, yeah, so funding and this is kind of the foundation of why we have to do some of these, uh, some of the papers that we do. It, it's not the kind of grant where an individual stipend gets sent to you. Um, it is not from an external organization. The USG and your institution are considered part of the same organization under the USG. Uh, so the funding goes to the institution to complete the project. That project is defined in the service level agreement, the agreement between um, the USG and your institution as the um, proposal that you had sent um, in its final form. So if you had any clarifications, we added those. Uh, that is what's considered the statement of work. So it's given to the institution to complete the work on the statement of work. The statement of work has you as the team. It has the budget. It has the work that needs to be done. Um, funding can cover your time, uh, your professional development, uh, materials that you will need, uh, things like computer hardware, software, uh, things like that. And funding is released 50% at the beginning from the USG to the institution and 50% at the end. So when I say the beginning, I mean when the service level agreement is signed by both your institution and the university system office. Now, the system office, that signature cannot be me. Um, that's kind of a, <laughs> that would be a conflict in who signs the thing, right? Um, and it's the same thing on your side. It has to be an official signatory over in your institution and not yourself. Um, then on submission of the final report at the deadline um, that is due, you'll also be sending in the second invoice for payment. That's when the second part of funding gets sent out. Now, that doesn't mean that you have access to just 50% of the beginning, depending on your institution and what they do. And this has to do with um, your grants office or your business office. They may run a line of credit for the entire grant, or they may wait for payments uh, from us. It depends on the institution and their common practices. So why do we do this? It's because of flexibility. Uh, for example, um, Teams can change from time to time. If personnel change, that's OK because our agreement is with the institution. There's hardly anything that needs to be changed in the SLA for that. The institution can take care of the shift in funds from one person to another. Uh, changes in your needs as the project goes on, things may suddenly take a different turn and you may not need software X. You may need software Y. That's OK. You're able to work that out with your institution and the SLA covers that. We can also do no cost extension of funds very easily. So let's say that you used um, some of the funds during the period of time in which the grant took place, but you still had some left over. You want to improve these resources over here. You want to present on your findings at a conference. You can totally do that. Um, institutions reach out to us and we just say, yes, we approve of that. And then it's fine uh, so that that uh, money isn't going directly back to us all the time. We would much rather that all of the funds that we have awarded be used towards the success of the project, towards student success in general, uh, than coming back to the USG. And of course, the 50%, 50% ensures some uh, accountability. It's the way that most USG grants and awards go. So be sure to be in contact with your business and grants office. We already had you do this as part of the acknowledgement form, uh, but there are going to be some things that vary from institution to institution. And if you reach out to me about it, I'll usually be referring you to your institution because it isn't really our thing. 
So for example, anything in PeopleSoft, uh, your chart fields, your five digit and seven digit numbers and all that stuff, that is an institutional thing. Uh, we have no idea what that is. You've got your one grant number over here, and that's either a three digit number or one with an M and then three digit number for your continuous improvement grants. Um, all of the technical stuff in the back about your account, that is institutional. Um, whether or not uh, overload pay is permitted or summer pay, uh, at particular institutions, they're great with it. At other institutions, they say, nope, we don't do it for anyone. At some institutions, they say, well, for nine month faculty, it's this. For 12 month faculty, it's this. For staff, it's this. Uh, so be sure to know what your institution can do with the plans that you have. Um, same thing for course releases, uh, same thing for how students are compensated, uh, same thing for how external consultants are paid. So if you have somebody coming in as a web designer, if you have a partner that's not uh, a co-SLA person, like if you've got a double institution thing going on, then you don't have an external consultant. But if you're bringing somebody in to help out, um, then that would be that kind of thing. Uh, how physical and digital materials are ordered. That is also a very institutional thing. So uh, that's just some of the things that your business or grants office will usually coordinate. So what do they need to know? Well, first of all, these are allocations of state funds. They are not coming from an external organization. Um, they are not. This work is not work that your institution is not doing. Uh, it, it's it's not something that um, goes on at your institution for the benefit of some other program that is uh, outside of the University System of Georgia. Uh, in some of those kinds of programs, you will see something called indirect costs. It uh, usually comes across as facilities and administration. And that means that, okay, so this non-governmental organization wants people in our institution to do this meaningful work. Well, that's great. We love external grant funding, but also that project is not ours. So you have to help us keep the lights on and keep grants administrators uh, doing all of the ponderous work that goes with external funding. Um, that doesn't happen with the USG and an institution. It's a service level agreement. So indirect costs like facilities and administration are not part of any of these budgets. Direct costs are, and direct costs aren't just the money that goes directly to you. It means anything that has to do directly with uh, covering the project, covering your time. So salaries are direct costs. Fringes that are connected to that compensation are also part of the direct costs. Uh, supplies are also part of the direct costs. And the taxes that are included in those things, um, things like Medicare, Social Security, you know, that kind of FICA med expense, that's also part of direct costs. So when you take a look at your grants office breakdown of how payments are going to be dispersed and you see fringes on there, those are not the kind of indirect costs that are not permitted. They are direct costs that are associated with your time and with how somebody is paid. Uh, so uh, a little bit of a different thing. A lot of people will take a look at their breakdown and go, well, all of these are indirect and this part is direct, so this part doesn't work. It's only if you've got the keep the lights on stuff going on, like facilities and administration. You usually see it as F and A. Um, yeah, so this is why we had you discuss your proposal with your grants office. There can be a lot of confusing things going on, and both you and your grants office need to be aware of it. So what is a service level agreement? It's an agreement between the USG and the institution that some work's going to get done, and here's how it's going to get done, here's how it's going to get funded. Uh, we'll go through all of the parts of it. It changed a couple of years ago um, after uh, an incident where someone kind of disappeared off of a project, and we go, oh man, we didn't exactly define how that works. And even though it's implied a little bit, we could do a better job of making that clear. So now, if you had a grant in like 2015, 2016, service level agreement is going to look a little different. So we're going to go through all of these parts. The first part is that stuff will be completed at your institution, and that stuff is in the statement of work. It's appendix A. It's over there, 
or Appendix B, the other one's the RFP. Um, so your proposal is the statement of work. The stuff that you propose to do, that's the stuff that your institution is going to ensure will happen. Uh, what's really important to know is that your proposal is the most important part of this agreement. It is the meat and potatoes of the whole thing. It's got your budget. It's got exactly what's going to be covered. It's got your impact, your personnel. Um, if somebody has to leave the team, definitely let us know in the status report because it's important for us to acknowledge the correct people. But it doesn't require our approval to substitute X instructor for X instructor, that type of thing. Um, it's good for us to know, but it's not something that we have to do written signatures for or any line item changes. We don't do line item editing in that same way because of all of this, the institution ensures all of that. Section two is pretty standard. It's the starting and ending dates. All the start dates are going to be December 9th, 2022, because it is the kickoff date. Um, make sure that the end dates are correct. If you picked summer 2023 as a continuous improvement grant team, uh, be sure that summer 2023 is on your service level agreement. I don't think anybody picks summer this time around. I think just about everyone is fall. So just make sure it's fall 2023. Section three talks about how project funding works. We've talked about this already. This is material you've seen in the RFP as well. Um, but be sure to look at the first line because it has the award amount on there. If it's not familiar to you, um, then you may have some questions. Uh, the date and the final semester are there as well to uh, ensure that, okay, here is the deadline, that part. Now, section four is newer. Um, if you had an SLA in the past year, you've seen this, but if, if it was before, then you may not have. It's the what if stuff goes wrong section. Uh, if something does go wrong, please contact us as soon as possible. We need to know if your plans have changed and something went really differently because of it, or if your project has been going and all of a sudden it's come to a stop and it can't get started back up for some really big barrier reason, be sure to let us know uh, because we can either work with you on things like amending um, the SLA to change the deadline if that's what we need to do. Um, we can clear up some questions that an office might have about what an ALG grant is because sometimes there's just a misunderstanding going on. Uh, yeah, anything that we can do to help your project be successful, we would like to do that first. We don't want to go, well, OK, I guess this project wasn't completed and therefore we're not giving out funds like we would much rather work with you to make sure that this gets uh, that, that this gets done in the best way. So, yeah, if there's no way to fix it, the USG can evaluate how much work was done. Um, usually this would be through the legal office and through ethics office or something like that. This would be a huge deal, a very rare occurrence, and they might then pay according to the amount that of work that has been completed. Um, like I said, this all arose from uh, a project where everything got stopped in its tracks because someone just disappeared and no longer was on the project and no longer worked on it. And that is super duper rare. Most of the time, this stuff is uh, really cool. Uh, so if anything like that ever does happen, please let us know and we'll work uh, with you to make sure that this is a success uh, successful project and however we can. Now the rest is regular agreement stuff um, that we put uh, on anything that the USG would, sh would share out. One of them is like a legal compliance thing that uh, this is a state agreement and therefore you can't ask for more money than we've already saved in here. You can't ask for a line of credit from the state. Um, that's just standard. Uh, same thing here. If the agreement is somehow outside of federal or state laws or if federal or state laws changed and all of a sudden the agreement somehow outside of it, those laws prevail over the service level agreement. Probably is not going to be a huge problem here, but that's on the uh, that's on all the agreements we have. Number seven is an anti discrimination clause. Always great to have. Uh, eight is that we can modify this. The USG can, but we need agreement from both parties. So if we have an amendment, we need signatures on that amendment. Uh, so if you have to delay your project by a semester, 
that's a big change to the service level agreement. So we'll need your signatories and our signatories to sign off on that. Um, and then nine is just that both parties agree because uh, the next section of it is the signatures. And what we're saying that time is of the essence, needs to be completed in a timely manner. So that's the whole service level agreement. It's uh, especially about procedures and compliance with laws and stuff like that. And then the most important part are the appendices. The first one is the request for proposals. That gives you the whole purpose of the program itself. And then Appendix B is the um, your statement of work, uh, your proposal. So first we draft the SLAs. Uh, these will be done probably on Monday and I'll be able to send them out to all of the project leads. Um, usually what happens is I give a limited time for you to check the dates and budgets before I send it off to um, any business or grants office contacts. Uh, but because of the circumstances this time around, I am going to have to send them simultaneously. So please do reach out to your business or grants office if anything looks weird. Um, it shouldn't, but if if something does, please do. Uh, I am going to be out from next Friday all the way until the beginning of January. I'm uh, taking care of a family member. They won't be able to walk for a couple of weeks. Um, so that's, that's why I'm going to be gone. Uh, so that is why I need to send these out as quickly as possible because I can't really give lead time and then send them out past that point because I will not be here for uh, the end of that lead time if that's the case. So that is why that's going out uh, simultaneously. Now, when we get the Board of Regents signatures, this is where things are opaque to everyone. We get your signed, uh, your institution signed SLA, right? Then we get it in a requisition, which means that we are um, encumbering the funds in our budget to make sure that we can pay this project. Uh, at the end of that process, you get a purchase order number. That is how we're able to pay invoices. That stuff is really cool. But in the middle of that, the business office needs to send the contract over to legal services and legal services needs to route it to um, very high up administrators in the USG to check these over and sign off on them. Uh, the part where the business office uh, receives it, we know that part. How far it is in the queue for legal or uh, how much it's legal trying to go through these resources and how much is an administrator not being able to sign it, we have no idea. Um, that is something that we do not have any tracking over. Uh, yep, yeah, May, May says that signatures are done through a smart grant software system at KSU. That's very cool. Um, yeah, so there is this part of it where we just do not have that information. Uh, until it gets back to us from the business office, we do not know. But once we get it, we send it um, right back to you and to the business or grants office contact. Um, so yeah, we can automatically check with the business office on where something is. But if it's with legal, all they can really say is that it's with legal at the moment. And when we ask legal where that is, they usually say the contracts are signed in the order that they arrive. But you don't always know. Uh, so let us know if something is being really held up and we will reach out and try to expedite. It's uh, it, This is kind of the part where there is this gap in between where we can see what's going on. I, I don't like that. I've tried to find out different ways that we can uh, make that whole process transparent, but there just hasn't been uh, a viable option here. <laughs> so after that, after it's fully executed, we send it to you, we send it to the uh, institution. The first invoice from the institution should come to us. Um, at that point, you have a purchase order number. We are able to pay that first invoice. So that's going to come from your institution, not uh, personally from you. Uh, you don't just draw up an invoice and send it our way. This is like if you're at Kennesaw State University, KSU is sending a KSU invoice. Now, if you're at Georgia Tech and our agreement is with Georgia Tech, 
the research corporation should not be sending us an invoice. Georgia Tech should be sending us an invoice because there are two different suppliers in our system. And if they don't line up, um, we will just get uh, We'll, we'll get it sent back to us saying, no, 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 we need this from Georgia Tech, not from the Research Foundation. There's only a couple of instances where this happens. Uh, Georgia Tech has one, the UGA Foundation has one. Um, there was a weird supplier address error going on at Savannah State uh, a little while ago, but that's over with now. Um, yeah, just make sure that because these agreements are with the institution, that the invoice comes from the institution as an organization. Now, Accounts Payable pays these and they pay them through ACH. Uh, someone in the business or grants office is usually responsible for receiving ACH payments. And sometimes those payments come in a big lump payment from the Board of Regents and just says Board of Regents on it. And what they need to do is break it out by various items that are being paid in order to find out, oh, OK, so this is where you paid the ALG grant. Um, most of the time, that's not a problem, but we have seen a couple of instances where uh, things from Office of Faculty Development, like Chancellor's Learning Scholars, is getting paid in the same payment that ALG stuff is. And, you know, if they ever have any questions about that, send them my way and, and we'll get that worked out. So what is the first report that you have to do? If you are a transformation grant team, then you're going to be checking in every semester to let us know how it's going. These are really big projects uh, with a lot of uh, meetings and consensus and a lot of project management behind them. So um, you'll be checking in through a semester status report at the deadline, uh, the report deadline for each semester. It will not apply to this fall. There is a deadline coming up in December for fall uh, 2022. You are just getting started. We do not need a semester status report to know that you are just getting started. Uh, so it will start in spring 2023. It's a Google form. So if you are going to be out of the country in a place that blocks Google, please be aware of that. Um, we do have a word form that we can work out if um, if needed, but usually we do want them in the Google form. These are not highly technical. Um, they are more checking to make sure that stuff's on track and that uh, you don't have any burning questions that are just hanging out in the background for us. So in here, um, there's the submitter info, proposal info. Please be sure to use the three digit number or the M three digit number on there. You will have an account number that's different. And if it looks like 720055333, Please do not put that um, because you, you are not proposal number 721,000. Uh, please just give the three digit number that we do in our notification of award and on the SLA. Uh, that way we can look it up very quickly. Uh, yes, so usually what we do is we send out a reminder to grantees that the deadline is coming up for the next one. Uh, it's always going to be uh, referred to on the grants info page too. Um, be sure to list the team members. If there's somebody new, uh, that will be very important. Uh, list the final semester. Uh, and then we're asking things like, is it on track overall? Um, which phase of implementation are you in? Are you teaching with them right now? Or are you uh, just developing them at the moment? Um, a list of materials. If you're only using a couple of things, you could put it in the form. If you're using a ton, um, just make a Word document and email it to me. That's a lot easier than trying to put all of that in a form. And what I'll do is I'll just put it in a, um, a Google Drive folder and then link it over on the spreadsheet. So it won't be a problem. Um, just how is the review going? How is the adaptation going if you're doing that? How are any uh, new materials that you're creating going? Uh, any questions about hosting them? Um, how's the course redesign going? Any other work? Catch all question. Uh, changes in personnel, any changes in impact. Now, if you find out that you're going to have one less student in one section of the course, that's not a big change to an impact uh, to your uh, impact numbers. But if you find out that suddenly there are going to be 10 more sections that are affected or 10 less sections that are affected, that's that's a lot. So then you would definitely want to let us know about that. And then, of course, any other questions you have.
The final report, everybody submits a final report, not just the transformation folks. This is only submitted at the end of the final semester of the project. I believe everybody has selected fall 2023. Um, these are always available from the Grants Information Center page. That Grants Information Center link is right here, and we will include it in our follow-up email that has the uh, kickoff recording in it. Once that's all processed, I believe that'll probably be about Monday. There is one path on this final report form for transformation grants and one for continuous improvement. Uh, they are slightly different because we have a few extra questions to ask the transformation folks. So we're not going to do a walkthrough today because that would take a very long time, but that's why I went through each of the components individually. Um, when you're going to submit your final report, you just go right to that Grants Information Center page that I have uh, linked in the chat. And there are five things that you'll you'll need for this. You'll need the Word version of your final report. That's really important because this is a way for you to always have a saved copy on your end and a copy of the narrative on our end. You don't want to write a giant narrative in the uh, online form that we have. It's just too hard to do. But if you've got a Word document version, that's really easy. Uh, be sure to have all your data ready if you're going to send any of that. Uh, be sure to have your syllabi ready. Um, a photo is optional for your team, uh, for your class. That's uh, helpful for us in sharing out uh, testimonials and promotional materials, but it's not required. Um, and then the second invoice, if you have it. Some institutions will not send the second invoice until they know you have sent in your final report. That's totally fine with us. Um, we can accommodate that for sure. But if you already have it, it's very easy for us to uh, take that second invoice and then pay it because we already know that the final report is complete. Uh, for continuous improvement, you'll need the Word document. Um, and if the materials are linked there, uh, if they're in a Google Drive, if they're hosted on a website, then that's it. You're good. Um, yeah, uh, if not, um, then you'll want to, you'll have to find a way to share them with me. Often you can get them in cloud storage and just email them my way. So when you're sending materials, yeah, you can combine all of the files into one zip and just send them all over. If that doesn't work, there's Google Drive, there's Dropbox, there's many uh, different ones that you can do. Your Microsoft OneDrive, although permissions kind of get weird in Microsoft OneDrive. Um, yeah, so you could do plenty. Uh, the method for us doesn't matter so much because we're going to host those after that in OpenALG and Galileo Open Learning Materials. So like I said, if you're going to do a photo, um, be sure to do it of your entire team. Don't just send separate headshots from the website. It will look very weird. Um, yeah, if you've got a whole team that, and you're able to get together for a picture, that's really cool and go right ahead and do that. This is the team uh, from UGA for a project. You'll see Eddie Watson over on the left. He's now at the AACMU as a vice president. Um, you see uh, Chase Haggard over here. Uh, Chase is now at the University of Utah and running an academic success program. And it's pretty cool to see them <laughs> once again. Upcoming reporting deadlines. So I have already sent out an email to the ALG grantees list before I added uh, round 22 on there, uh, that their reporting deadlines for their projects is December 19th. You do not have to submit a semester status report for December 19th if you're transformation. If you're continuous improvement, you don't ever have to submit a, st a semester status report. Uh, spring 2023 will be the first time something's due. That is May 15th. Uh, summer 2023, August 14th. And then fall 2023, December 18th. And these deadlines will be listed on the Grants Information Center. Uh, once again, if you are a project lead, please bookmark that page. You may not need it now, but in five months, you're going to go, when was this due again? And you can go right to that page and go, oh, of course, sure. Um, now, <laughs> this is a weird time because we are going to have a new website. We are hoping that we're going to be able to either redirect everything or we're going to keep the same links. Um, if that does not happen, we will let you know and uh, make sure that you know where to go for this information. We will still have a grants information page. It just may be in a different place. 
Now you are already added to the ALG grantees L listserv. Um, these, uh, this listserv is for all grantees, all the way back to round one, if they feel like staying on, all the way up to round 22 and beyond. If there's something where it only involves a certain amount of grantees, we will put it in the brackets. So if I wanted to just contact all of round 22, in the subject line, I'd have in brackets round 22. Um, people can get kind of confused about this because I'll send something about report deadlines and someone in round 17 who's already submitted their final report is like, what the heck is going on? I've already submitted my final report. It's like, yes, that's because these are for round 22. It's in brackets right there. Um, most of the time though, we've just got general information for everybody. Uh, they are usually going to be about deadlines, but not all the time. We have some uh, publishing opportunities that arise from time to time in the national or global OER uh, scene. And at that point, we will share those opportunities with you because you're doing such cool work. Why wouldn't you want to uh, report on your findings, your research, your best practices too? Uh, so we will share that kind of stuff out with you as well. Now here, you wouldn't want to respond uh, in the listserv and then ask, OK, what's going on with uh, this particular account at our institution? Uh, you know, this person's phone number is XXXYYYZZZZ. Uh, because if you do that, then everybody's going to get that question. Uh, if you got any personal questions, any um, questions that relate just to your project or uh, if some sort of circumstances arise, please let me know uh, directly. I'm at jeff.gamont at usg.edu. So that is a big rundown of all of the procedures. The next thing that you're going to see from me is an email with the kickoff recording and your SLA. And that SLA is also going to go to the grants office that works with you on this uh, to get that process going. Now the holiday break is what it is. Uh, there are plenty of people in these offices that will be out of the office in over the break um, because they, uh, you know, they're going to see their family or something like that. So some of these processes may take a little bit longer than if we got them started in February and they had February, March and April to do it, something like that. Um, so if anything winds up lost, please let me know and we will find out about that. Um, the other thing, and it's something that's going to be on this email and it's going to be on my away message. While I'm out on FMLA, uh, please be sure to send SLAs and invoices to our, our Galileo admin here, um, Dina Anderson, which is dina.anderson at usg.edu, which I just put in the chat. Um, she is super helpful in getting all of these signed and paid. Um, yeah, uh, Dr. Von Brown says, should we expect to receive the SLA by the end of next week? Yeah, I'm planning on getting these done on Monday and getting these sent out on Monday um, because by the end of next week, I am going to be out on FMLA uh, for the 16th all the way until the 2nd. So I'm making sure that this all gets out very quickly. Yep, and so I will have a lot of information on there for you um, uh, on that particular email, but be sure to have the Grants Information Center uh, link saved because that is a place that you'll need to come back to over and over again. So this is the logistics stuff. I mean, we can sometimes do this in an asynchronous meeting, but I think it's better to be here and make sure that uh, questions are answered and that type of thing. So I am going to go on to thank you uh, for being here and saying that we can't wait to see what happens next with these projects. Uh, I'm going to open this up for questions before we go. Thank you too.
Thank you. And you can uh, either unmute to, add, uh, to ask a question or just type it in the chat if you would like. Oh, uh, OK, because people will be following the meeting. Yeah, uh, send me an email about your timeline, uh, Karen, and that's going to be the easiest way. Yeah, oh, and uh, Dana, who says synchronous was good to get us motivated to come? <laughs> well, I'm glad I I'm glad everybody gets to see each other uh, through the camera. That was really nice. Well, OK, thank you all for being here. And uh, yeah, oh, had to go to another meeting at 3 p.m. Yep. Have fun, Sarah. Uh, so. Yeah, I'll be sending an email to you next, um, but other than that, uh, have a great holiday break. And uh, I, I know that some of this work is already ongoing. That's really cool, uh, but a lot of you will be getting started in January. Uh, be sure to reach out whenever you do have a question. Uh, but if it is between the 16th and the 2nd, please be sure to send documents uh, to our administrator, and I will have that on the away message for sure. Yeah, happy holidays to everyone. Thank you. I'm going to stop the recording now.